I am Gang Ni, a social professor in the School of Information Technology, Deakin University, Australia. Big Data presents opportunities to learn new insights and transform business and society. But it also creates new risks when Big Data meets artificial intelligence. This is my Study Australia Masterclass. Both two terms are quite popular nowadays, but many of us may remember when we have a movie, artificial intelligence come into the world, and this is the first concept of artificial intelligence many of us are aware. More recent concept of intelligence applications could be related to computer chessing. For example, like uh, before 2000, 1997 and 1998, we have IBM's computer, Deep Blue, defeated the human champion. In 2016, we have another very famous computer program come into the world. It's called AlphaGo, developed by Google DeepMind, and uh, it played against the human champion, Lee Si Do from Korea. And at that time, uh, the human cannot compete with the AlphaGo program. Big data is a concept which came in the recent decade. However, it's closely related to another concept which has been well known by IT users. This concept is called as Moore's Law. The basic idea of Moore's Law is that every two years, the power of a computer will be doubled. And at the same time, the storage of a computer will also be doubled. And many of us have seen Across the years, the price of a CPU has either reduced or the same price and you can buy a more powerful CPU. And one of the immediate consequences we can see is that people can find more opportunities to store the data. We can also see that every second or every minute, we can have many data generated on the internet. Those kind of data could be your watching history of YouTube videos, could be your Twitter message. And this is the area we call it data deluge. And the data deluge give us those kind of, say, convenience for us to use different kind of services. But for business, it also bring us the opportunities to utilize those kind of internet as well as the IoT devices to capture the data about our as a users. For example, we may have a web browser uh, that attracts information to us, which can help the company to identify what kind of products the user will be interested in and what kind of behavior patterns a particular user might have. And based on this kind of data, the company, they can use it to do profiling of the customers. And when a new product is coming up or when they want to launch a new advertisement, those companies, they can utilize this kind of user's data to send the targeted advertisement into the potential customers. That's also why this, uh, nowadays you can see uh, most of the companies uh, related to advertisement, they are with internet as a background, like Google's the Alphabeta or Facebook. And uh, at the same time, traditional media services that's uh, related to the advertisement, they are starting to take a small just a proportion of the market. Many of us call this era as the big data era. We call it as the fourth paradigm of science. Jim Gray, as a United States computer scientist, uh, he described that humans' scientific discovery, they have three past paradigms. The first one was the empirical and the experiment discovery of the science. That means they need to take a lot of times to observe what kind of data has appeared in the scenario and then try to use some kind of formulas to explain those kind of data. And this is the first paradigm. Second paradigm is called a theoretical paradigm of the science. They were trying to come up with some nice formulas and nice theories. And based on the theory, they will generalize it and then they will use it to forecast the future. 
and that's the theoretical paradigm of the science. The third paradigm is called the computational paradigm of the science. The key idea of it is trying to use the computer to simulate complex phenomena and also trying to use different kind of mathematical models to modeling different aspects of the objects we want to do the modeling. The current paradigm we call it as the fourth paradigm is also called as data exploration. The starting point of the fourth paradigm is different. They start up with the data captured by instruments and generated by different kind of say simulators or sensors. And then using advanced algorithm, try to identify what are the patterns, what are the knowledges embedded in this kind of data. And then once knowledge has been discovered, scientists will try to validate it to see whether it's correct across different kind of scope. In this kind of, say, science discovery, one of the key things which make a difference is the artificial intelligence. Around 10 years ago, in the magazine White, uh, the cover page is called as the end of science. Why is called as the end of science? The main idea is that starting from uh, very beginning when people are doing the science, they either start from the observation or starting from the life theory. But now, as we are moving into the big data era, what we are going to do is we are trying to see from those collected data, whether we can use some kind of method to automatically help us to come up with a theory, to come up with some kind of knowledge automatically generated from those kind of big data. But why artificial intelligence can help us to do all of these kind of things? The main reason is that we know humans are mainly limited by our speed and attention Spam. On the other hand, we know computers and especially different kind of, say, computational devices can come up with a very accurate result with very efficient as a speed. And also, as long as the power supply is there, they can continuously do this kind of calculation as a, with a longer time than our human experts. Behind this artificial intelligence and the big data, there is one very important technique behind it called as machine learning. If we know that a computer or a machine can do a particular task, but is it possible for us to train the machine so that the machine can accumulate experience so that it will do the work with more and more this accurate result? In 1997, Tom Misha, a professor in CMU, College Mano University, he defines machine learning as a computer program which can learn from the experience with respect to a particular task T. We have a performance measure, the which is P. And then we hope that if the computer is assumed to be with the learning capability, we say that as the accumulation of the experience, the computer's experience with this task T will be improved as a, in terms of the measurement P. So this is a little bit more formal, but a more um, scientific definition of what is machine learning. For machine learning, we can see there are many different kinds of applications which many of us have seen in our everyday life especially if you are using Gmail. Those kind of email service, they could help us to identify a spam email. And then when we have a new spam email come up, the system will be able to automatically put this kind of suspicious email into the spam folder. And this kind of spam detection has been, become more and more accurate. And the one which can help us to distinguish between a yes or no, this kind of machine learning task, we call it as a supervised learning. And for the training of the machine, you just need to tell the system what is spam and what is not spam. And across the training stages, the machine will be able to help us to automatically identify the spam email. 
And when we use this same kind of method to do this forecasting, for example, like we want to forecast what is the particular student grade and what is the marks. And if the grade is just a pass or failure or high distinction, this kind of forecasting we call it as classification. But if the one we want to forecast is the value, for example, like say, what is the mark? And this kind of task is called as a regression. Regression is closely related to the mathematic methods, for example, like linear regression or polynomial regression. But in the machine learning and artificial intelligence, we have more modern methods which can help us to do this kind of, say, regression task. For most of the everyday life tasks, we can see that we have the binary classification. Typical example is when the system see a lot of the spam emails, and then they have a repository system which can help the system to identify whether an incoming email is a spam or not. What the system need is, they sometimes need the user to manually to annotate the email as a spam email or as a, a normal email. And then using different kinds of machine learning model, they can do this kind of classification with more accuracy. Another kind of machine learning task, we call it as unsupervised learning. Uh, one of the very nice tasks is to do the artist work using machine learning. For example, when you present a lot of photos to the computer, and then the computers will be able to generate many different kinds of photos, which was unknown to the users, but it looks maybe similar to those kind of photos the computer have seen before. And nowadays, they have been widely used in the area like say computer vision. We may have heard of different kind of concept like say GAN or deep fake and all of those kind of things that are based on the techniques we call as unsupervised machine learning, especially the deep learning methods. And another kind of machine learning task we call as structure learning. Structure learning just means they want to find out the mapping between two different kinds of structures. And uh, one typical example for structure learning is they want to find out between two languages and whether one sentence in a language can be mapped to another sentence in another language. And if you can maintain this kind of mapping of the structure of human language properly, this is also known as the machine translation. And if this structure mapping is not between two languages, but between two different media, one media is our voice, another media is our text description. And if this kind of mapping can be automatically established by a computer, and this kind of application, we also call it as speech recognition. And the input of this kind of learning is a voice. And the output of this kind of learning is just an annotation or a text transcript of the voice. So this is another very popular kind of artificial intelligence techniques in the deep learning era. Using a particular software tools, you can apply this kind of style of uh, painting to your photo. And uh, of course, the methods behind it will be related to artificial intelligence method from the big data collection of the paintings. The system will be able to come up with a model which will capture the style information of those kind of, say, painting styles. And then from those kind of painting styles, it will also apply the techniques and the method and the models on your real data. After the combination of these two things, what you can see is the deep style of the photo. Another very similar kind of artist work based on artificial intelligence is the GAN. And the key idea of it is when the computer seen a lot of cartoon, there's uh, paintings and the joinings, and then the system can automatically generate many different kinds of draft 
so that the artists they can refine it. This can save a lot of say time for the creation. So we can have a look at those example. Um, this is the one that is uh, using the GAN, DC GAN, to train this computer for 100 rounds. And then we can see the generated result is not so clear, but it's pretty much just uh, grayscale pictures. But we don't know what is inside. If you keep this kind of GAN training for 1,000 rounds, we can see clearly this one, we can see cartoon characters inside as well as different kind of color. And if we keep going for 2,000 rounds and it looks more refined pictures, and this can be improved to 5,000 rounds or even 10,000 rounds. And then even more, they said, this is the result from 20,000 rounds. We can see this looks just like a human artist they said created rather than computer automatically created. And the most scary is the one uh, we call it as Style GAN2. And uh, if you have time, you can visit this website called as this person does not exist.com. And then you can see many real photos that looks like from a real person. However, they are not belong to any real person. They are just generated from GAN algorithm and using computer. And uh, of course, they can generate a photo, they can also generate videos, and uh, they can also combine different kind of video and photo together. And you may heard of those kind of deep fake and many other tools. So all of this, of course, you can see there are some kind of opportunities for different kind of media can be created. Of course, they may also have some other implications. Now let's have a look at those AI applications that's um, implemented and uh, researched in Deakin University. The first kind of say AI applications is the work we have completed more than 12 years ago. And the idea of this one was, is it possible for a computer to automatically recognize the human's age based on a photo? This is question number one. Second one is, is it possible for a computer to simulate my photo when I was 80 years old? So what we did at that time was trying to use the artificial intelligence method combining with the dimensionality reduction method. And uh, the technique behind it was trying to find the invariant things across different persons that's uh, from different ages. We know that all persons are getting old, but how are we getting old? From which aspect? And we build a artificial intelligence neural network has a tool to capture this. And then for each of the individual person, we're trying to use the known ages faces. For example, for a particular person, we may only have the photo at 12 years old, but how the person is going to be look like in the 20s. And then we can apply this model to generate those kind of faces for a particular person at a particular age. So this work was a very initial work. And of course, nowadays you can see different kinds of methods has been utilized to do uh, similar things. Second kind of AI applications is the speech-based emotion detection. We know many of the companies like uh, telecom companies or the other companies, when you make a phone call to them, uh, help desk, most of the time you cannot talk to a real person and I ask you to listen to different kind of music. But then the issue is, if you really have uh, frustrating things or really have the urgent things to discuss, to call, and whether the system can identify it. So the idea of this particular one is, they will try to recognize what is the emotion status of the person. If it seems to be the angry stage, they may give them an opportunity to have a, there's a human operator to connect it as earlier. The input of this kind of technique is the human voice, could it be telephone voice, could it be other kind of voice. Output is the emotion status. But what is special about this project is we didn't utilize the language because when you heard someone is talking in a different language, you don't understand, but you can still know that whether that person is angry or whether that person is, uh, is happy. 
So this is the um, special thing about this project. The third kind of project is the K-complex uh, detection. Uh, we know that many of us have um, there's a sleep stages, and especially the rapid eye movement stage, and we have different cycles of the sleep. However, for the drivers, when they are in the stage two, they are actually sleep, but they believe that they're not asleep, so they fear that they can still drive. So in this kind of situation, is it possible based on some signal to tell whether the person is moving from the awake stage to the N2 stage, to the sleep stage. And that is the um, motivation behind this work. And we utilize the EEG and using those kind of signals to identify whether a particular person is falling into sleep or not. Another case study that's in our university is the trajectory analysis. And we all know that when we go into a supermarket, we don't randomly, there's a walk around. And many times we visit a supermarket with a purpose, but whether the supermarket, they can know what is your purpose, what is the thing you are interested in, and if you know that you are interested in, can they give you some kind of targeted advertisement or not? So this work was done with my as an overseas research partner. What we did is, in a particular supermarket, on the trolley, we have some kind of sensors to recognize what is the movement, the trajectory of the customer. If the customer is always moving around in the food area, and then when the system detect that, the trolley is moving towards an advertisement board, the advertisement board could potentially give them some kind of targeted advertisement. And this kind of things um, is a very good combination of the data as well as the recommendation system. Another kind of um, application of AI is we can use artificial intelligence to recover the damaged data. This kind of damaged data could be photos. For example, we can have a photo which was uh, 50 years old and then it's not clear. Is it possible to have an algorithm which can help us to recover the original pixel information inside of it so that the pixel will look that's smooth and also looks like there's no damage at all. And if we formulate this task as a matrix completion task, we know that every photo, we can treat it as a matrix with a lot of rows, a lot of columns. Some kind of rows or column, the pixel value could be missing or could be damaged. But then is it possible for you to come up with an algorithm which will fill those information inside? Or if some kind of pixel which has been replaced by noise, can we just identify this kind of noise area and then restore them back to normal? So this is also artificial intelligence method. For big data, we know that it could be used to recognize our human behaviors as well as our human preferences. But when we combine this artificial intelligence with big data, what will happen? Let's have a look at some kind of research area which is changing the world. The first one is called a behavior informatics. The research problem comes from the social scientist. And we know that many regions, many countries, they are significantly dependent on the tourist as, a, as an income. But then the issue for the tourism analysis is, for many countries, they don't know how those tourists move around in their country. And one of the earliest work, uh, when my research group was touching this area was with Hong Kong Tourism Board. We know that in 2007, in Hong Kong, there is an IVS scheme, that's individual visitor scheme, and there are many visitors coming from mainland China who will stay in Hong Kong for one week. But the problem at that stage was the tourism board or even the tourism industry in Hong Kong, they didn't know how those tourists move around in Hong Kong. They just know when they arrive at Hong Kong, when they exit the board of Hong Kong. But within that stage when they are in Hong Kong, what they do and where they visit, they have no idea. 
traditional research methods for this kind of travel behavior analysis was based on survey and questionnaire. And we may see in the airport or in the train station, we may have the surveyors which will distribute the questionnaire for the passengers to ask them questions like say, what is your age and what is your annual income and what do you do That's, uh, yesterday, what do you do on the first day when you come to this country or when you come to this region. However, most of the time, when you ask a person, what do you do three days ago? What do you do five days ago, six days ago? They don't know, okay? they forget. And uh, also sometimes when you visit a particular place, you may know it's um, photo, but you don't know what is the name of that place is. So based on this kind of issue, if we want to do this kind of movement analysis, do we have a better method? Exactly 10 years ago, my research group, we trying to use another kind of media to find out what are the common movement pattern of the tourist. The idea was based on the geotagged photos. We you know nowadays, most of the photos taken from digital camera or iPhone or the other smartphones, they all come with uh, metadata we call as GPS information. So if you know a particular user, he uploaded 10 photos on a particular day, you can link this GPS information of that user and then you will know that how the person move around. So this is the idea of this big data analysis. At that time, we just uh, crawl almost all the public photo uploaded to the Flickr website and for the users that's in the Hong Kong area and uh, analyze what is the popular photo points and identify what are the time that's when they are getting busier. And then based on this kind of analysis, we will be able to know among different group of the tourists, what are their favorite hot spots? And then what are the busy time of those hot spots? And based on this, we will be able to come up with some kind of recommendation of a tourism package for different kind of group of users. And at the same time, because we also know that if we put all of those travelers as tragic information together, we will be able to see from a particular location and what is the most likely next stop for those tourists. On the left hand side, we have the Asian tourists in Hong Kong. For example, a location like um, Central Mong Kok, you know, there's uh, nearly 70% of them, they will go to Chin Sa Chui area. And then the other, that's uh, 20 to 30% of them, they will go to the Hong Kong Central. And from different kind of group of passengers and the group of tourists, you will know that what are their favorite, there's a movement pattern. Based on this, it's likely for the, um, the sort of bus company to see whether there's a need to design as a new bus route or whether there's a need to just remove some of the existing bus route. So this is the one which has been significantly depending on the big data. If you are checking about what is the technique behind it, it's just based on the web crawling of the public photo and then statistically analyze the frequency of each location and the frequency of each time at which there's a location. And we will be able to identify many different kinds of interesting patterns from it. Geophoto provides us the information about at which time the person appeared at which GPS location. But for a city like Hong Kong, one GPS location it may be related to a really tall building. Inside the building, there may be train station, there may be gym, there may be restaurant, there may be hotel, there may be cinemas. But what the person was doing, you don't know. Can we know a little bit better about the context of a person? We hope so. Why we hope so? If we just have a passenger who provide us the GPS location, on the left hand side of the picture, we can see that he visited four places and then we don't know what are these four places. But in case we have the context information about these four GPS location, we will be able to tell the person get off the train 
and uh, visit the shop and then go to the restaurant after that with that's a stay in the lounge of the airport and this is the movement pattern of a person but how we can get this kind of information about the person's behavior and this one uh, nowadays is very popular we have one service called as venue check-in service many of us if you are using facebook you may do check-in if you are using foursquares you may do check-in if you are using yelp or using Uber Social. Most of the time, when you accept the service of agreement from the company, you may just accept it, but without considering what kind of information you agree to share with the world publicly. And let's have a look at one example. This example was from Foursquare. We can see this passenger visit Hong Kong airport more than 40 times, and then at which time uh, he visit this same location. If we can identify a particular travelers of the check-in data. We can link all of those kind of check-in data together. And this is a table which link all of those kind of check-in data of a particular tourist. From here, we can see at the very beginning, he visited Hong Kong International Airport. And then five days later, he left Hong Kong International Airport. So from inside of the check-in information, we can see what he visited and what is his favorite restaurant and then what is the place he checked in as for the accommodation. So he is an example on how much detail this kind of information can provide us. Of course, if we treat this kind of checking information as a photo, we can still put it on the top of a map and then we can see at which location, what is the busy time and at what kind of business, whether it's popular or not popular. And this table and also show us different kind of business among different group of travelers, how popular are they and whether there is a significant difference between Asian tourists or Western tourists when they are in Hong Kong. At each of the tourism spot, we can also see in a whole week, which day is going to be very popular and then which time is going to be very popular. For example, like shopping mall in Hong Kong, we can see they are very busy on Saturday and Sunday. The busiest time is the afternoon 12, um, 2 o'clock, but in the normal day, like the weekday, they are not so popular. And the same pattern you can find for many other tourism spots. The example we have seen is just about how we can use big data to find the insights in the business. But when we combine big data together with artificial intelligence, we may find some things which the user may not want to disclose. And this is the one many of us may care about. So we can see on this example, we can find two users, user five and user six. These two users on the system, they didn't show that they know each other or they follow each other or they are that's the friends of each other. They didn't show any of the information. But from the publicly available check-in record, we can see that in the past two or three years, they visit many places and many countries as a together. And then from here, you may identify that at least these two persons know each other. Maybe they are in the same family. So this is one example. The second example, we identify a three item set. Um, but this three item set is not a frequent item set. It's a combination of two frequent item set. We have a user, user nine, who is a male. We have user 10, who is a female. And these two have a very frequent check-in record in the year 2015 to 2017. At the same time, the user nine and the user 11 they also have another series of this kind of checking record in the 2015 to 2017. However, the tricky part is this users 11 and the user 10, they didn't know each other. They have no common checking at all. So from here, maybe you can identify that some kind of information may be sensitive to the user 9. And then if you are this user 9, maybe you should care about this, whether you should check in so frequently or not. 
or whether the system they should provide some kind of mechanism to protect your privacy or not. So this is something we can see the potential risk when we have the artificial intelligence applied in the big data. Nowadays, if you're checking about the popularity of the data science skill, you can see in the past five or six years, the data science skill shortage has been increasing. And many people consider data science as the hottest job you haven't heard of, or to say it is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Because nowadays, almost every aspect of our human life is related to the data. And uh, when this kind of data is digitalized, stored somewhere, it's possible for us to use smart algorithm and artificial intelligence algorithm to analyze it, to find some kind of insights into it, to help the business to do better that's a customization of the product or find out the group of users which can be suitable for the target advertisement. So if you are interested in this area, data mining, data science, data analytics, or artificial intelligence, or business intelligence, you can find Deakin University. We provide those kind of courses at the bachelor level, master level, as well as the PhD level. And Deakin University is among the top of the university worldwide, according to Shanghai ranking. I am Gang Li, a social professor in the School of IT, Deakin University, Australia. Thank you for watching my Study Australia Masterclass.